Hello, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to this I'm Koikor webinar on careers in trading. My name is Ankur Pruthi. I am from the batch of 2007. I am based in London. I run foreign exchange trading for Norgis Bank Investment Management. Um, I've been trading for 10 plus years now. Um, I see that ahead of this webinar, there was a survey about your favorite movies about trading. Um, there were some fine movies in that list, um, but one common thing in almost all these movies is the stereotypical trader. It's not just the movies. Popular books like Liar's Poker perpetuate the image of a testosterone-fueled, brash, greedy, loud white male desperately doing his uh, best alpha impression. Um, we have uh, five very experienced traders here on our panel in this webinar. And, and hopefully, by the time we sign off, um, you'd be convinced that this trader stereotype that I talked about is, well, um, just a stereotype. Real life trading um, is far, far removed from uh, um, how it's depicted in popular culture. Real life trading is analytical. It's quite quantitative. And with so many bright kids uh, uh, picking this up every year, um, it's getting increasingly nerdy. I mean, even if it, it isn't already. And, uh, and yes, um, it is a lot about uh, understanding your own cognitive biases and controlling your own emotions. Trading truly is uh, um, survival of the fittest. But then it is a very rewarding career not just figuratively, but um, uh, quite literally too. Uh, but before this turns into a monologue about trading, uh, let me talk about the agenda today. We are here to demystify trading and careers in trading. Now you could make it um, a career uh, out of trading any asset, uh, potentially from lean hog to, to dope coins, but for practical reasons, we will limit this discussion to rates, equity, and foreign exchange. We will try and talk about the institutional setup, uh, which is you know, specific to each asset class, and we'll discuss the role of a trader um, in each of these setups. Uh, we'll then talk about how could one go about making a career in trading while still at school, um, and we'll discuss what skills are needed uh, for a trading career. Uh, we have a diverse panel here with representation from banks, um, hedge funds, real money, and corporates. Um, we have people who trade flow, people who trade prop, and people who trade both. We will discuss how roles and responsibilities differ depending upon your market segment. We'll then talk about the future of trading and, um, and try and guess when our robotic overlords are going to take over. Um, and finally, if there is time, we we'll try and touch upon other themes like uh, professional qualifications and, and gender diversity. We'll wrap it up with a rapid fire round. And, uh, but before I bring in my panel, I must point out that all of, us, all of us are doing this in our personal capacities, and we're not representing our employers here. All opinions expressed here are our own and have nothing to do with our employers. Um, and so we are, here we are. I will introduce the panel according to the batch vintage. Um, uh, from the batch of 2002, uh, we have Atin Gupta. Atin is based in, in, in Singapore and has worked in fixed income for City and Goldman in the past. Atin now works for a Singapore-based hedge fund. From the batch of 2003, we have Saurabh Shah, who is based out, uh, who is based out of Hong Kong and runs index volatility trading for Sashita Zengal. Um, I'm very keen to hear from Saurabh because what he does for a living sounds very esoteric to me. From the batch of 2007, we have three participants, including yours truly. Um, all three of us learned the, our first lesson about market timing the hard way because we made the trade of buying into financial industry at the highs of 2007, um, just months before um, the trouble started. Uh, the world has never been uh, the same again. Um, Manoj Sinha from 2007 is based in Singapore as well. He has been with GE Treasury for six to seven years now. 
Abhishek Chaturvedi is, from 2007 is based in Mumbai and works for ICC Securities. Abhishek has made a couple of very interesting jumps along the way. Finally, we have Arijit Ganguly from the batch of 2009. Um, Arijit is, uh, is based in London and heads Asia FX trading for um, Europe and US, uh, Deutsche Bank. Um, let's get started then. And um, let's see the questions in reverse order. Um, Arijit, I will start with you. So um, my first question uh, is, what does flow trading mean? How is it typically set up in a bank? And what do the folks in sales and trading do? And later on, I'd like to see if Atin can comment on this from rates or in an Indian bank perspective. But let's start with you, Arigi. All yours. Hi, Ankur. Um, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so let me jump, uh, you know, let me dive right in. So when I think about flow trading in a bank, uh, you know, our role basically comprises of really three things. You know, the first thing, uh, which is which is I think very more intuitive, is we we assist clients and the markets in price discovery of an asset. Uh, so what that means is most of the time we are always try to uh, come out with the price of an asset of what it should be at a point in time. So that's basically a job of a trader. Now, if you're working in a bank, along with this comes the role of market making. So what we are doing, once we know the price, we also provide liquidity at that price to, to, to our clients, to, you know, to market participants or whoever want to be. Uh, so this is the part where a trader is actively involved in trading his, his book or his portfolio. Uh, the third bit, what we do is actually, and, and, and a lot of people don't know about is, is a trader is actually also needs to, you know, advertise his voice, as we say, you know, you need to sell your asset class or you need to sell your product to the market. You know, you might be a great trader, you might be coming up with great ideas, but if you're not advertising it to the markets or, or going in front of clients and bringing these ideas to them, it's really of no use. Uh, um, and, and we all know there is a very strong correlation of your actual volumes to the revenue that the you know that the institution produces so i think a bigger part of the role is also actually marketing you know your trade ideas marketing your uh, marketing that the product that you're market making in and in this respect you actually work with sales uh, and you interact with a lot of clients and 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 kind of be you know kind of come up with ideas what where you think there is value for the market so really, I think if you look at a trading desk in, in an institution, it is really like a small independent, you know, like a business unit. Uh, you know, you have traders, you have salespeople, uh, and there is some financial uh, uh, resources allocated with it, along with human resources allocated to that unit. And your job is really to take that little unit and and see how you can generate value for your shareholders or for, or for, the, for the institution that you're working in with the resources that you have. Thank you. Um, can I ask Athin to step in and, and you know, uh, talk a little bit if, about, you know, fixed income, if, if, if it is any different from what um, Arijit has just mentioned, or, uh, and if it's possible to bring in a perspective from an Indian bank. You know, you've worked with City and Goldman, so um, all yours. Yeah, hi. Hi, hi Ankur. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, good to be part of this. So I think broadly, uh, uh, Arijit has covered uh, the basic definition of uh, flow trader. A couple of things I just want to add is one is uh, basically a trader is like a face of that institution to the market. Whatever the market does, uh, you have to, uh, it goes through that particular trader. And secondly, whichever markets, whether it's uh, equity markets, commodities, or uh, a fixed income or foreign exchange, uh, very in especially in banks, uh, very few guys just do only flow trading. It's it's a combination of flow trading as well as prop trading. Uh, it, uh, what percentage of trading you are doing as flow and what as prop it depends on various uh, stages of your career, various uh, uh, banks. But it's it's a combination of both. That's that's all from my side. Thank you. Um, so, is it fair to say that you know in most places, um, even when folks are doing flow trading, then uh, you know there is a there's always an element of 
element of prop where you know people don't necessarily offload risk the moment they they get it or or do you mean to yes. say that it, it is possible for people to actually run that risk for a significant amount of time yes so uh, effectively what the, you're doing is you're making as as uh, arijit also mentioned right you're making prices to a client and client can will give you some risk hmm. now, what you do with that risk is totally up to you hmm. you can straight away defuse that in the market you can uh you can wait for ultimately yes the the risk has to be diffused into the market the timing depends totally on you okay. so there's a element of prop also in that i mean apart from the other risk probably you'll be carrying it sure and you know arijit mentioned this about speaking to you know clients and and you know being externally focused is is that true in an in indian context as well you know when you trading fixed income for you know city for example uh, were you out and about with clients, or did you speak a lot with clients? Well, clients are definitely important. I mean, uh, the, the only thing is, how do you define clients? There are different mm. different markets have different clients. For example, in fixed income, life insurance (LIC) of India, right? That's mm. the biggest client. Mm. If you're trading specifically that segment, so uh, clients are definitely important. What they are doing is really important, and you definitely speak to clients on and off. Hmm. Um, but uh, it it depends on as, as I said it depends on what gen, what percentage of your trading is prop and what is sure. percentage is, is is flow. Sure, thank you. Um, can I bring in Abhishek at this point of uh, point of time? And Abhishek, is is it possible for you to talk about the functions of treasury in general? Right. So we've talked about the part where uh, you know. Um, we've seen that traders are assisting people or clients with hedging and you know price discovery, but there is another part the in the bank which is treasury, which is taking care of the bank's own assets and liabilities. So is it possible for you to talk about you know what are the functions of a treasury in a bank and what is the trader's role there? Yeah. Uh, hi, Angkor. Uh, thanks for calling me in the webinar. So uh, I will not be repetitive because most of the sales and trading part has been covered by Arijit and Adin. So apart from these roles, I suppose there is one balance sheet management, which is an equally important part of the treasury. The balance sheet management includes your uh, managing the asset and liability. Basically, it's a management of risk for a bank. So for a bank, your uh, risk is mainly in the terms of interest rate and the liquidity risk. If the bank is more of a domesticated bank, not having any FX exposure, much of FX exposure, so in uh, for banks, it is asset liability management. Now in asset liability, there are two kinds of risks. One is uh, market uh, of the assets and liabilities of a bank. And then it's a liquidity risk, which is more quantified by the maturity profile of the assets and liabilities. Apart from the ALM, the other uh, balance sheet management uh, roles or uh, functions are also to adhere the regulatory ratios of the RBI. So RBI has a different uh, reg, reg ratio, which are important which in terms of the RBI, because uh, managing the risk for a bank. So these ratio include CRR, SLR, and the recent one, which is LCR, liquidity coverage ratio. So all these reg requirements are also adhered by the balance sheet management guys for a treasury buy. The last, not not so much. Uh... I think I've lost Abhishek there, or is it just me? Hello? Hello? Is it just me, or...? Uh, I think we've lost Abhishek there. So um, can we then move on to Saurabh? Um, um, Saurabh, uh, um, what I'd like to know from you is um, is a little more about you know cash equity trading. The cash is of, uh, equity is, of course, a completely different animal, right? So uh, I imagine it is set up slightly differently than FX and, 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 and rates. And... Um, once you've talked about cash equity, then you know um, we can probably talk a little bit about your own bread and butter, like how is equity derivatives trading different from cash equity trading? 
Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, equity is, uh, is, is, is a bigger market in terms of volumes. Uh, we're talking equities, uh, which trades roughly $60 trillion a day, compared to FX, which trades around $5 trillion. Uh, again, FX is, is a small world as well. Uh, it's, it's like, okay, top eight pairs would trade probably 70% of the volumes. While in equities, there are thousands of stocks, indices, and we're not even talking about derivatives yet. Uh, I would say equities are more expensive to trade, wider spreads, higher exchange and clearing costs. Uh, while if you go to uh, fixed income, it's, uh, it's low volatility business, so typically much more institutional and uh, much more bigger ticket sizes. Uh, Two things that have changed this landscape or blurred it, uh, especially from the retail point of view. One is easy access to EDFs nowadays and online trading platforms, which makes uh, the, the uh, distinction between asset classes uh, much more blurred. Uh, talking about equity derivatives, uh, you can uh, divide it into two main uh, type of products. One is Delta One, which is, uh, for example, futures, forwards, CFDs, div swaps. Uh, on the wall side of, uh, of things, there you have options, warrants, variant swaps, wall swaps. Then you have loads of structured products catering to retail. Uh, it's, it's, again, uh, much more institutional uh, equity derivatives as compared to equities. Uh, on EQD side, probably only 10% trades with retail, uh, much shorter holding periods on EQD, mainly speculative in nature and catering to hedging needs of portfolios, I would say. Okay, and, uh, and you know, just in terms of sales and trading, is, it, is, is the setup similar to what, what has already been mentioned in FX and, uh, and rates? Yeah, it's very much similar. Okay. Okay, um, um, let's let's move on to the next section then, which is, I believe is probably of interest to a lot of people here. Like, how do you get into trading um, in a bank or, or in a treasury for that matter? Um, so uh, let's start with Manoj here. And um, um, uh, Manoj, my question to you is, um, what can a B school student practically practically do during their you know two years on campus to to set themselves up for a for a trading career? Sure. Uh, hi, Ankur, and hi, everybody. Um, unfortunately, uh, there is no detailed course in MBA which talks about, you know, practical aspects of trading. And uh, also, like many other professions, academics is just a small part of uh, the requirement. So uh, in my view, if somebody wants to uh, build a career in trading, I think in, he can start with uh, maybe uh, attending a couple of uh, online courses on trading. Uh, or they can also start with um, uh, trading in FX or equity market with small or maybe virtual corpuses. Like I remember uh, when we were in um, uh, in Amco we uh, we participated in lots of uh, trading games in B school competitions, and we also had uh, this um, online virtual account with uh, FX trading uh, sites like ONA.com. So these are few things which uh, one can do uh, to be familiar with the in trending environment and maybe uh, to boost in the interviews. Uh, is it, uh, so do you mean to say that it's a very hands-on hands skill then, right? Like not something that you learn from textbooks. Is, is exactly. that what you're trying to say? Yeah, so if I, if I, I, I were to read, I think, the academics play only 20% of the part where, which is also more or less automated right now. You have very good prices and uh, uh, a good market intelligence. So what is left uh, to be learned is the, uh, you know, trader's behavior and the behavioral aspect of a trader, which can be learned while you are in the market. Hmm. Um, uh, Athen, uh, sorry, Arijit, let's, let's bring in Arijit there. He's a recent graduate. So Arijit, uh, did you agree with what Manoj says? Um, uh, yeah, I think Manoj has kind of uh, kind of highlighted a point that it is very difficult to learn about trading per se while you're in college. But I think I can only share my personal experience as to what I was doing at I am Code. You know, so um, I was actually quite passionate about trading because um, uh, and, and you know I used to actually uh, the little funds I had I used to actually trade the Indian equity markets while I, while I was there as part of I am Code. You know. 
uh, a little bit to my detriment, given that we had the big crash during that time. But you know, but still, um, I was very passionate, and uh, you know, I used to invest a little bit of money, but I used to be in the market, and you know, to to kind of figure out whether whether trading is really for me or not. And uh, one more point I I would like to add here is that. While you're at B school, uh, you know there are certain things that you can actually do. You know, uh, the trading market has gone through a world of change in in the last few years. You know, uh, you know when if I go back ten years, you know all that really people looked from traders was their knowledge of Excel. But now, if I look at it, you know, given so much information is available in the market, you know the you know the quality of data has you know gone up exponentially. You know, so you really need tools. to analyze all the data that is available and you know and and you know like a couple of great tools that gets talked about all the time in the markets are coding languages like python uh, you know things like r you know uh, uh, and obviously things like matlab you know if you have a working knowledge of these when you do join a environment you will find it much easier to to come up with ways to process the huge amount of data that is that is kind of available to you um i would also say uh, people should spend a little bit of time growing more aware of the broader world uh, you know trading is all is is a lot about being aware of the world around you and figure out why something is happening and how will it impact the market so i think you know that bit you can start already while you're at the b school you know it doesn't take much to go through you know go through some of the financial publications uh, from time to time to figure out why things are happening and how they are going to impact you excellent so just uh, uh, a couple of things to add like arijit arijit uh, said you know i could probably also say that um, one thing that every aspirant should do is to read a lot read 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 and read a lot um in terms of working knowledge of our um uh, python or matlab um you know the term working knowledge or the extent of working knowledge keeps keeps changing with every passing year but we'll we'll come to that when we when we um we have a full segment on future of trading but that's an excellent point uh, that um arijit brought up as so i'd like to bring in the serial alumni here atin and saurabh and we we'll, we can probably start with with atin and atin you worked in the industry for many many years now and given your experience um are there any skills um or specific attributes um, um that you often see uh, younger traders bring in with them yeah hi uh, so yes i mean trading has as as was mentioned the trading has evolved uh, f- uh from 2002 when i joined the markets uh and uh, you see more uh, more it more tech based more program based so you you see these young traders who basically have this knowledge of both uh, programming skills as well as uh tech skills that's a clearly they they have an edge on that um yeah so i think every year the technology changes the the style of trading little bit changes so the easier you, the faster you adapt it's better for you so i think i see that in uh, in the younger traders sure sarab would you would you like to add something here yeah uh you know i i happened to see one of the webinars for marketing uh and and uh, people there happen to mention that the only thing you take out of your education is the knowledge of uh, ms word and uh, powerpoint at least in equity derivatives i can tell you it's a very different ball game uh, you need math engineering or hard science at every corner you need mm-hmm. analytical skills you have to be on top of news uh, the skills that the young people bring to the desk is hunger and and most importantly no baggage like for mm-hmm. us 2008 is a big baggage you know it mm-hmm. changes the trading styles i mean any any trader who has traded 2008 <laughs> has a different peculiar trading style you know yeah. uh, uh, never be short tails you, you always cover yeah. your uh, you mm-hmm. know black mm-hmm. swans etc uh, but but the guys who come out of institute come with a lot of confidence you know mm-hmm. i like to quote uh, uh, or refer to this uh, uh peculiar you know there's something called as dunning kruger effect where uh where, where you start with this massive amount of confidence it happened to me as well when when i started the trading role started mm. with this massive mountain of ignorance and confidence i i mm. came in with this 
this thing that I'm going to be a star. I'm I'm I'm, I'm the. You know. uh, then then I was lucky to have two great years, and then then you get the first big loss of your career, and then you fall into a valley of despair. <laughs> Thereafter, it's a tough learning process, and and from there on, you really start honing the skills you really need, like focus, self control. You know, emotional stability is such a big element of of trading. You know, mm. if you've seen billions, you'd see that they have an in house counselor, and and you understand why. You really need to be uh, on top of your emotional skills. Your your strength as a trader has a lot to do with uh, with how you cope with losses, how you cope with uh, with with uh, everything, you know. And and one big element of trading is luck. Uh, mm. That no, no one can do without that. Yeah, better be lucky than clever. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> luck can only uh, be with you for for a certain amount of time. Thereafter, it's your skills. And there's uh, plenty of research that's published, um, which talks about you know this illusion of control that traders have and how it is negatively correlated with their performance. So, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks for that. Um, very interesting. Uh, so, uh, um, just to summarize, um, I think um, we can say that um, you know um, it, what you could do while in school depends. A little bit upon you know where do you want to get where do you want to get in like Saurabh mentioned uh, for equity derivatives or um, um, you know um, your hull and all other books about quantity finance matter a lot but you know for for things like uh, spot effects or, or bonds maybe not so much where it is more about you know getting the right mindset um, Arijit rightly pointed out that uh, you know programming skills are, are paramount these days everyone looks for them so um, I, I, I term them as basically um, must-haves. Um, um, these days, anywhere you go, you'd expect it to have, uh, you know, more than a working knowledge of um, R, Python, MATLAB, you know, um, or any other programming language. Uh, basically, the ability to work with large amounts of data. Um, so, uh, Let's move on to the next section, which is about uh, um, career pathways um, after one gets into a trading career. And, uh, and let's start with Arijit now. And Arijit, uh, how did you get into, into banking? And, and you know, um, how, what do you think one needs to do to excel once you are in? Yeah, so I um, I actually got recruited into Deutsche Bank um, straight off uh, straight off from IM, IMK. Um, so I think I think the most uh, the entry points from most traders at this point into the banking into the banking industry at least is is, is through the grad program. So so the grad programs don't specifically recruit for trading roles, but I think as a once you're into the grad program, you will do you will get a shot if there is any openings on the on the trading side. Um, uh, you know, that's normally in 99% of the cases how you get into trading nowadays. You know, earlier it used to be slightly different, but things have kind of kind of changed over the last couple of years. Now, now when you're in a bank and 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 you're working as a trader, I think it's 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 very simple, you know, to excel. You know, but trading like a lot of people had before pointed out is is um, is 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 very performance driven. You know, so the first thing that you need to, you know, to excel is really you have to achieve your targets. You know, every trader, whenever they join, are given targets, um, and 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 nowadays uh, you're also given on targets on how you're going to achieve that target. You know, there are quantitative metrics to measure uh, the quality of your trading performance. You know, uh, you know, achieving your trading performance with a huge amount of volatility in, in is is not considered quite uh, quite that good anymore. So, you know, first and foremost, you need to uh, you need to achieve all the targets that that are set to you that's one thing uh, second thing i would say is actually to build up your business i think a lot of people before me also pointed out uh, uh, as a trader you're really like the face of the bank and you're really running uh, running the bank's business or the institution's business for which you are responsible for and your growth will be directly correlated with the growth of that business mm -hmm. so you have to work with all the stakeholders and you have to work towards actually building that business and i think that's what 
really a lot of people like if you are if you're entrepreneurial in trying to go that business uh, third thing and um, i would say that has become more and more important over the years is that you need to also build your network you know uh, uh, you know trading seems to be a very lonely job where a trader is just sitting in front of the screen looking hearing the news looking at the data uh, but i think a, 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 you need to have a strong network if you actually want to excel because at one point or other you will actually need other people to help you you know i you know you will realize most traders realize at a certain point in their career that uh, you know you can't do 100% of the things yourself and you will not know uh, 100% of of that is to know about everything so you will need to ask for help and ask people about help so i think building your network is very important as well sure um sarab uh, if i can bring you in again um did you come in through a graduate program too or you know can you talk a little bit about how did you get in and and you know how did you get to where you are yeah sure uh, i was kind of lucky i i had this massive interest in derivatives uh before joining k i had, I had no idea about markets so i i kind of thank ud to to uh, bring me this uh, this hunger about derivatives etc cetera, etc cetera. and i was very lucky to get uh, a placement into a trading role uh, i mean there's a long story i, I wouldn't uh, use this platform but uh, but eventually i moved to hong kong uh, in an international banking atmosphere uh, so uh, so what i would say uh, i mean i i agree with uh, everything arijit said uh, just a few things i would add is uh, uh, traders they is all about pnl Uh, in the end you know uh, it, it's simple when i do objectives of my team it's very simple uh, rest all doesn't matter you know uh, rest all is is there to 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 uh, make the hr people happy but but eventually it's all about pnl so so i'd say keep working on yourself uh, keep keep learning from others there's there's this thing that you you tend to be within yourself you uh it's it's always uh easy to to criticize yourself or appreciate what you do but there's so much to learn from others especially in in trading and then leave it to corporate jobism it's 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 eventually uh it'll take care of itself you know uh and and one last thing i'll i'll like to add is emotional grooming i mean that's very important Uh, so sort of I sense a little bit of tension there, like where you say that the only thing that matters is PNL, and you know, Arijit said that um, you know talked about getting help, and um, you know, so what you said it seems like it's a very individualistic thing, but at the same time you need to depend on others, others as well. So how do those two things reconcile then? Right. Correct. I think it all depends on uh, on the role as well, and and what kind of uh, you know if you're on flow side prop side uh, buy side mm. sell side etc mm. uh you know there's uh, so when i when i when i look at any trading role uh, mm. i look at it as uh, it has some franchise value to it and and it has some individualistic value to it uh, on on buy side of things it's predominantly uh, the trader you know on, mm. on sell side of things there's a lot of franchise value there's there's a lot of uh, uh, systems matter a lot uh, I like to compare it to uh, to being a driver in an F1 seat. You know, uh, it's uh, as a trader, uh, it's the skills you have, but eventually, it's also the car you're in. Uh, it's, mm. it's it's the technical superiority of the car, uh, which is why you you need to have. Uh, you know, at so many times, I I have to discuss with the cons team, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and and then we start talking about equations. Mm. which is why i said you know it's 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 important to to have the knowledge of that because mm. eventually if you want your car to be the fastest you need to get into the engine and 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 work on it absolutely that's a that's a beautiful analogy by the way um um if 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 i can bring in um uh atin at this point of time um and atin how um how 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 did your journey start, and you know how did you manage to get to Singapore and and be in a position that you are in now? I think you're on mute, Atan. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Personally, for me, I mean, I always had interest in trading, as, as a lot of people have said. Um, that they used to do paper trading, or they used to do a little bit of trading in equity markets. I mean, I always had interest in trading right from. my school days 
um, and um, I mean, I passed on into on two, which was uh, unfortunately a year of September 11 happened. So the only trading job which I could get was a local primary dealer. Um, but I, I mean, I mean, coming back to the second part also, I mean, in this, it's a small market, right? It's a small world. I mean, to give you an idea, a big franchise bank will have like two or three traders per market itself. Hmm. So, so it's not a big world. Uh, you'll have in India, for example, you'll have 40, 30 to 40 big players. Uh, so it's sort of a group of 100 people in one particular market. So hmm. if you do well, uh, I mean, and by doing well, I mean uh, mainly from the PNL front. If you do hmm. well, then I think the switching of jobs is, is not an issue. Hmm. Uh, there are different trading styles which each trader has. And generally, a franchise, a, a big ma market player, want to ha cover all those trading styles. I mean, some are good in momentum trading, some are good in macro trading, some just on technical analysis. So, you, ideally, you want to cover a lot of all of these styles. So, as long as you excel in whatever you do in whichever markets you are, I think moving jobs between within the bank or switching banks. Is not that difficult. So, then, uh, when you moved to Singapore, were, were you still looking at, you know, um, from an offshore center like Singapore, still looking at Indian assets, or is it something else? Or, or these offshore centers trade a lot of, you know, different smaller markets? Yeah, I mean, one of the advantages basically of moving to a hub is that you can trade a lot more products, uh, which in any country, not in only India, mm. and most. Asian countries, for example, because of compliance reasons, there's restrictions on that. Mm. Uh, not And even in the same products, the type of diversification in terms of the types of leverage or structuring which you can have in an offshore, in a in a hub, financial hub, is, is immense. So uh, when I moved to Singapore, I mean, I started doing, uh, I mean, focused with, because I've spent more, most of my time in India, focus mm. was in India, but yes could do more of Asia and uh, global stuff. Sure, thank you. Um, Abhishek, question for you here, you know, uh, you've made quite a few hops along the way. I, I remember you started with Reliance Treasury and now here you are at ICIC Securities and, you know, a couple of other hops on the way. Um, what has helped you making those making those switches, you know, from a corporate treasury now to ICIC Securities? So, uh, Ankur, I totally agree with what Atin mentioned is because trading is a very small word. So even in the rates side, a big bank, two to three guys, even a primary dealer, mm. a good primary dealership, a very big like ISEC is has only seven trading guys. Mm. So it's very small word. Uh, most of like four, three out of my four jumps is mm. because of references. Mm. So a good references will give you a decent jump and a good job. Mm. And references comes from your PNL. So basically, mm. in trading, it's pure for PNL. You make money, and mm. you will get your job and a good career prospects. Mm. So references are very very important. Yeah, definitely. At least in okay. a small market like if in India or so. Mm. And is are references important just from a PNL perspective, or just or also because you know these jobs require you know high amounts of integrity, right? So you're making decisions, which which affect like which 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 can have an impact of you know hundreds of crores of rupees. So I assume that um, you know high integrity also uh, places plays plays a part. Yeah, of course, integrity is kind of a necessity condition, hmm. but okay. not the sufficient one. So integrity is necessary. Yeah. Okay. But of okay. course, you should make money. Not on, not only integrity will fetch you a good job. Okay, thank you, <laughs> uh, Manoj. Uh, um, I remember that we both of us joined together. I say, say uh, back in two thousand and seven, and here you are in Singapore trading for GE. Um, uh, how does it compare with the bank treasury? And you know, um, how do you get in? Uh, okay, so a uh, function wise, I think um, a bank treasury or a corporate treasury are more or less the same. One very uh, striking difference is that um, the corporate treasury is 
a lot less chaotic than a bank treasury because you know focus is more on um, hedging the exposures rather than uh, a profit making like a bank so uh, yeah that is more practical aspect of uh, the look of a deal dealing room apart from that you know i can i can point out few differences in a corporate treasury and um, a bank treasury one being uh, there is no sales team in um, in a corporate mm. uh, a corporate has a very large um, cash function wherein that you look after you know cash receipts and cash payment and payments of the corporate um also a uh, uh, corporate treasury uh, is very lean in terms of number of traders because you know typically in a bank uh, there will be a specific trader for each of the market and for each of the instrument mm. where in uh, in a corporate uh, typically uh, fx trader um, will deal in almost all the uh, markets and in all the instruments mm -hmm. yeah so so you know you need to you need to be uh, uh, you need to know a lot of a uh, lot of markets then to work for corporate treasury so yeah the yeah. yeah the role is more transactional it's a lot of a uh, lot of volume a lot of um, asset classes you deal into so i take care of um, fx in risk rate as well as commodities uh, sometimes mm. so yeah it's a lot more um, you know wider than a, a bank bank treasury mm. or a bank trade So can I ask you a question here? So you know, I I understand the part about the breadth of your role, but um, do you know, um, or or once you get in, is it require? I mean, is it is it a prerequisite that you have a sufficient level of depth too, right? Like, or it can't be that you're just scraping the surface, and you know, when you're trading all these instruments. Yeah, of course. So. Uh, uh, you know uh, the only only aspect uh, uh, where is it it is different from a bank is the uh, you know profit making otherwise apart from that the uh, uh, depth in knowledge about each of these asset classes hmm. is a prerequisite uh, for such roles sure thank you um you know I, i'll probably take a moment here and talk about uh, my my you know my own journey so i i got into an mba in um, 2005 and my own um, reason for uh, getting into mpa was because i wanted to get into sales and marketing so i did this summer training with with itc in 2006 and in in two and a half months i figured out that it that was not for me um i think this is a this this internship that we have in an, in our mbas um Uh, in two year mbas um it is a fantastic thing because it gives you you know an opportunity for mid course correction like it worked out for me um So I decided to, you know, to go into sales and trading, and and to be entirely honest, um, I got this job with uh, ICICI, and I, I I didn't know whether it was going to be sales or or it was going to be trading. It it happened to be sales. I worked for say in sales for a couple of years, and then realized that it was not for me, and moved into trading, and 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 um, here I am. Um, but that that was my story. But uh, let's bring in um, Atin now, and Atin works for for a hedge fund now. and um i think just want to understand like how is working for a hedge fund different from you know um working at a bank of course you don't have any flow but in terms of what you do, do on a day to day basis how how it is different yeah at, uh as you said there's no flow for sure uh i think the main difference is the quality of the pnl mm -hmm. um in the sense that there's no cushion of flow uh, pnl coming from flow or balance sheet so it's totally 100% prop mm. now uh, you can uh, so i mean let me just start with what basically a hedge fund is how, how is it different from a bank mm. uh it, it basically it's it's like a um, what we more commonly know in india as a mutual fund it's a, it's it's just a different name in the global community mm. um it's less regulated you uh, you take money from big institution investors and uh, you have to give them a return um you generally have a mandate in terms of which all markets you will be trading which all products you'll be trading and very difficult to go past that unless you have to notify the investors uh, beforehand uh and 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 finally how do you get paid i mean the investors give you two types of uh, uh sort of revenue one is called the uh, management fees 
and second is the performance fees hmm. it's based on uh, how you perform if the investor is not happy with you he, they can, they pull out money if they're happy then they can uh, put in more money so that's typically is a, a hedge fund uh, basically they trade the same markets as as you trade in a in a, in a bank right there's not much difference uh, in hmm. terms of products in terms of markets which you trade hmm. the only difference that i was saying was is uh basically there's no flow income hmm. so the style of trading is a little bit different the characteristics the social aspects of trading is is slightly different hmm. but uh, the main difference is, is is the quality of the peanut that's all exactly so you eat what you kill right yes i mean uh, you uh, in every every bank every bank of, uh, trader has a certain percentage of flow pnl as a certain mm. percentage of uh, balance sheet pnl okay there's no mm. trader whichever markets mm. uh, you have that mm. uh, depends on which bank you're working on which mm. desk you're working on but uh, mm. i think someone mentioned also before uh, there's a, there's a there's a value of the desk mm. okay, which is irrelevant of how you perform mm. uh, in a buy side it's not there in a, in a hedge fund that value of desk is not there so it's totally up to you sure and i think now that i have you here you know you've made this journey over the last 15 20 years so are you able to talk about a little bit about uh, you know a typical progression for a trader so the question that you know in a bank for example the question that i'm trying to ask is is it, is it just the risk budget that that keeps increasing as you get you know more and more senior or are there other dimensions um to your role that um, yeah. that change yeah i mean i've always believed that trader uh, can grow basically two ways one is you trade within the same geography you trade different markets you did for example in india you trading fx you trade rates you trade equities you trade credit you start trading a lot of different markets you start mm-hmm. your career with one market but you gradually move on to different markets mm-hmm. uh, second is obviously you you trade different geographies within the same market so interest rates you not only trade india you trade asia you trade global you trade us you trade latam you trade anything okay mm-hmm. so that's from a trading perspective uh in general in a bank for example you can decide if you want to have more of a managerial responsibility in trading or you prefer uh just trading mm-hmm. i mean if you uh, so for example normal progression in a bank is you become junior trader head trader then head of trading then head of markets then you become a ceo so it, basically as you grow senior you be, you take more and more managerial responsibilities mm. and frankly less of uh, trading responsibilities mm. um the second aspect is you basically uh, move to funds uh, move to hedge fund where it's there's hardly any managerial responsibility very little mm. but mostly it's 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 trading based r- responsibilities so it totally depends on which area you're more comfortable with which area you you want to go in sure um sort of if i can i can bring you bring you in here now so you are in a many yeah. responsibility do you still get your hands dirty or or pushy mails oh no no i i i would never leave the trading uh, and be a manager it's just uh <laughs> uh you know it's uh one thing i would like to uh to especially uh, address to the uh to, to the imk community uh who will be graduating soon uh there's something i wasn't prepared for uh typically on the sell side in international setups uh, you start as trading assistant you know uh, and as a trading assistant the things you need to do is is amazing you are buying lunch for the desk uh you, you you're doing all the uh, bookings all the uh, all the shitty work um uh, I, i've seen uh, the, the head of desk uh, ask the trading assistant to uh, take his coat to the dry cleaner i mean it's it's all sorts of things you need to do uh but that's the time when you learn so much from about trading from all the traders on the desk uh and and that's something one needs to be prepared for because uh because one one doesn't know right i mean i i i never knew that uh i'll ever have to do something like that so uh so yeah it's it's uh, it's uh, in a bank setup it's it's pretty straightforward you you're trading assistant then as atin said you you will uh, 
develop into a trader, you will expand uh, through bigger mandates, uh, you know, different markets, uh, eventually to either head the desk or go to a regional global role. Um, so it's, it's pretty straightforward in, uh, in, in a banking setup. Uh, it's only when you move outside of the banking setup, then, then it becomes a lot more uh, entrepreneurial, uh, a lot more uh, proprietary in nature. Sure. Um, can I bring in Arizit here? Arizit, what Sarab described, does that resonate with you? Did, would you? Would you agree? Is that how you see it in London? Um, so I think, uh, let me first uh, address the question, which is uh, how you can progress. So I think if I look at it, um, I think Atin mentioned it very well. Uh, your career progression actually sometimes can depend on where you're trading out of. You know, if you're trading out of a restricted market, the way your career progression will move ahead is you will be trading more products in that same markets. But if you're typically trading out of a hub, say like Singapore, Hong Kong, London, you would actually start trading more markets versus going much deeper into each of these markets. So I think mm. as you grow in a hub, you start trading more markets. For myself, when I started, I started with Eastern Europe. Uh, and then I moved to Asia FX and, and now I look at EM as well. So all of EM. So there are like a lot more markets that I can focus on. So that's one way to grow. Um, mm. The second way that I think um, um, I think was also mentioned that you you, you become in charge of a direct desk. So, mm. you know, you still have to, you know, you still have to kill as you as you said before, uh, but still you take a broader responsibility in managing the risk. You, Manage the manage the trading, uh, you know, the entire trading PNL of the desk, and you're actually responsible for growing the business of the desk. That's mm. that's how you will be evaluated. Mm. Uh, and in terms of my personal experience, I would say it was slightly different from what he what he said because I remember when I joined Deutsche Bank and I sat on a desk. I think uh, I think three days into sitting on a desk, I was actually given a big book. And mm. uh, I, I don't think I could even go out to get a lunch. It was so busy. Obviously, it, it, I, I'm in flow, it, so it tends to be uh, reasonably mm. more busier. But I think I was proverbially, you know, thrown at the deep end of the pool and mm. and and, and kind of started on my job from day zero. Perfect. So there's a bit of a contrast there. Um, uh, can we bring in Manoj here? Manoj, uh, you know, we've talked about banks and, you know, we've talked about those two different dimensions going more towards, you know, prop sort of roles or, and the other dimension of going more towards managerial uh, responsibilities. How does it look in, in the corporate world? Yeah. So I think uh, Atin and uh, Arijit and Saurav covered it quite well, actually. Uh, if you talk about trading per se, trading typically has a very, you know, flat structure. So uh, a trader will always, uh, you know, uh, a trader will be trading for a longest time, actually, even if mm. the level changes, right? So uh, uh, a typical career progression in a corporate will be, uh, like others said, will be to include other functions, maybe like mm. uh, 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 middle office and back office uh, into your role or uh, including cash operations as well into your role. And uh, or it might be about uh, taking, taking care of more geographies, you know, sitting mm. into a hub. Singapore or uh, London, it, it will include taking care of more geographies as well. Okay, so mm, I think we've covered career pathways adequately, and uh, we can probably move on to the future future of trading. Yeah, um, and there's a lot of talk about uh, you know artificial intelligence and machine learning and how robots are going to take over the world. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how all this automation and all you know. The, the current trend, how is it affecting um, uh, trading roles? And and you can imagine um, uh, different asset classes, different geographies are affected in a different way. So um, why don't we why don't we start with sort of equities? Usually tend to be at the bleeding edge of things. So let's hear from him. You know what's happening in equities. Sure. Thanks. Uh... I'll come to that. Just I saw one question uh, pop up, and uh, maybe I quickly uh, cater to that and and move on to this. Is how do you come to trading if you cannot get a trading role straight out of campus? I mean, I've seen so many such cases, and it's very very important for the uh, for the people on the campus to know. Um, so yes, uh, trading is is such a small community. Uh, it's such a niche job that that it is very very difficult to find uh, a lot of trading roles uh, especially out of campus uh, what i've seen people do 
especially those who are uh, who are very passionate about trading and want to get into it. Uh, one thing one should realize is uh, a, a folly a lot of people commit is uh, just by trading by themselves, uh, even virtually or or with their own money, and showing results for two or three years in a row. They cannot go to a hedge fund or a, or a fund and and show it to them and get a trading role. It's it's, it's close to impossible to do that. Um, I think the easier way out would be to to join uh, a setup close to the trading role. I've seen so many people join uh, middle office, back office, uh, any sort of role that that is close to trading. Uh, typically on the uh, either on the front office side or back office side. And then gradually move on to trading. Uh, this, this to me has worked better than than uh, cold calls or 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 any other way. Uh, obviously, you need a bit of uh, a bit of experience in terms of uh, of trading. So, so obviously, if you trade on your own, that helps. Uh, that'll eventually make you convince the the uh, trading desk to to uh, get you there. Um, so yeah, uh, you you need to get into a setup. For me, it's very important to to be. Uh, I mean, the, there was one question as well. I saw. Uh, do I prefer a small role in a bigger setup or a bigger role in a smaller setup? I prefer a smaller role in a bigger setup to begin. There's a lot of learning. There's a lot of uh, things you can do, um, and thereafter make your way up. Um, coming back to automation and the future of uh, of this industry. Uh, so can I can I can I just interrupt you here for a second? Sure. So uh, you know this is not to not to discourage um, anyone who is trying to break in after after getting to a different sort of a role, but you know it is also probably right to to not to give the wrong impression. Do you see a lot of people, or have you seen a lot of people who managed to get into trading uh, lately, like uh, you know having careers in uh, or having started their careers in com completely different. Uh, completely different roles. Uh, difficult. Also, one should realize is a trader's life uh, is is not so long in in mm. trading. I mean, mm. uh, I mean, I was discussing this with Ronald before. It's really the younger you start, the better. Uh, mm. You rarely see fifty year olds as as active traders. You know, you mm. you can definitely be head of uh, head of uh, asset managers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, or a CIO role. But hmm. but older people are typically uh, less strong strong uh, emotionally or or even uh, you know uh, to to uh, to do a proper trading role. Uh, hmm. That's the reality of the things I've seen. Uh, I hmm. may be wrong, but but which means that th you have to start pretty early, uh, or sure. or you probably need to give yourself say max three or four years of trying hmm. before you decide you know uh, to to pursue something else. You don't want to, you know, bang on the same door uh, without any result. I think that is a very, very key point. Is that if someone wants to get in, then you know they should they should do their best. They should try different avenues, but th there should be a stop loss, right? Like you cannot try and yeah. keep doing this indefinitely. Absolutely. Yeah. So can we move on to the question about automation in in trading? Yeah. By the way, you stole my thunder with answering the question about you know. <laughs> automation please okay automation here you go um honestly financial industry was the first to adapt automation in the in the 80s you know uh when when the industry moved out of trading pits to to automated trading systems it was the very first time that uh that you saw all the uh, technical people move into finance and and uh, you know uh, and nowadays if you see uh, there there are so many technologically advanced firms who rely purely on on uh, on their technical capabilities so you have all the uh, you know uh, high touch low touch uh, automated uh, uh, you know uh, trading systems you have uh, uh, you have, uh, you know, all, all the trading bots, predictive analytics, uh, etc. So trading roles are constantly adapting to automation, and and I would like to come back to the analogy I used before about a, a F1 car. Uh, you know, technology plays such an important role. It is assisting traders to do whatever they are doing. Uh, whatever role you are in, 
uh, whether it be it buy side, sell side, uh, technology matters a lot. Uh, it is uh, it is the differentiating factor for, for between banks as well. Uh, you know, when, when traders are switching banks, one of the key things they do is to check how good their systems are. Uh, mm -hmm. So that just gives you an idea of uh, of how automating uh, how how automated this industry is. Again, we move to too much automation that's happening nowadays, which is taking in stings out of equations, which is why you see all the flash crashes. Um, so it's 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 an evol evolving industry. I, I've I've seen uh, I've seen a coder uh, give a massive uh, uh, you know platform for a PM in a, uh, on the buy side, and and he this coder is is getting paid like in millions every year. Mm. So, so that just gives you the importance of automation in, in this industry. Hmm. Okay, so let's try and bring in Abhishek here. Abhishek, uh, you are in a completely different context, fixed income in, in, in India. Uh, what do you see? You're on mute, Abhishek. Hi, uh, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Thank you. Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So at least in India, I don't see automation bringing on much bigger role as of now. Uh, just for an example, in the last 10 years, I haven't seen even a 10-year GSEC benchmark trading. Uh, except for 10-year GSEC benchmark, no other bonds trade much more or maybe not be even a 10 to 20% of the total market volume. So because of the market liquidity, I don't see automation is catering a very bigger role in the Indian context. Maybe some smaller uh, systems are being made for a dollar rupee, hmm. but I don't think, at least in a race market, I don't see automation bringing a much bigger role. Maybe after four or five years, when there is a more liquidity, hmm. then probably they can be a bigger role. Hmm. As of now, I don't see it much. So, so you're you're almost hinting that it's a function of uh, you know the simplicity of the trading contract and. And the liquidity in that contract, and that ties in, you know, perfectly with my own experience. So I trade, I trade spot effects, and spot effects, at least the, you know, the larger, the larger underlyings like euro, dollar, dollar yen, they're highly liquid. It's a very simple contract, and and that's the reason that um, uh, the biggest market makers in uh, in in these asset classes are completely automatic. So um, there was a time when um, there used to be thirty to fifty traders trading FX spot um, and that this is not um, too far ago this is probably five ten years ago 50 traders on a dealing room just trading FX spot 30 traders and 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 um, probably there are three or five now and Arijit can correct me if uh, um, if I'm wrong and Arijit, does that tie in with your experience I think um, I'm going to agree with you there I think um, I think there is a lot of automation that has come into the industry. But I think if you look at restricted markets, you know, markets mm. which have not opened up, I think a lot mm. more needs to be done, actually. Mm. I am actually on the other side. I think we need a lot more automation to come in, especially in restricted markets where you where you still have, you know, manual systems which adds on costs for banks as well as clients who want to transact in these markets. You know, uh, you know, like you mentioned euro dollars, but if you mm. take it somewhere else into some restricted market like like vietnam or somewhere like that it becomes a it becomes a completely uh, different ball game into 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 you know you're trying to provide liquidity to clients so i think a uh, a lot of the automation that has come into the industry has focused on getting prices to the clients in the most liquid markets and price discovery of these instruments but i think a lot more work needs to be done on restricted markets um, I think things like pre-trade, you know, where you're actually, uh, you know, actually exchanging documents with the clients and looking for reasons of trade. And I also mm. think a lot of work needs to be done on the post-trade side of things, you know, uh, not really applicable to trading and more to the corporate side. But I think these are the two areas I would love to see more automation come in. On mm. actual machine learning, someone was writing, I think it's become much more relevant nowadays, especially mm. with, with the COVID shock that came into the system. A lot of people... Uh, you know, used to trade on technicals and macro data, 
But I think with the COVID coming in and you know macro fundamental data getting completely muddled up, you know alternative data has come into the picture. You know, and and now everyone is running up, uh, running uh, to look for alternative data sources to plug into their trading models to figure out what's going on into the world. So I think if I look at it, it's a it's a it's a very evolving ecosystem which moves from one data source into another, one model to another as the marketplace changes. Everyone is looking to find that tiny little edge, isn't it? Uh, I, I also saw something coming up on algorithmic uh, algorithmic trading, and again, you know, the point still remains that algorithmic trading works well, but in highly liquid instruments like Euro dollar and S and P futures, or you know, U.S. ten year futures. Um, uh, it will take so the, the, before we get to the algorithmic execution stage, there is a there is a part about electronification of markets, and like Arijit rightly pointed out. There are whole swaths of market which are not electronified right, right now. So uh, you know, it's a multi-paced. Like if you look at it worldwide, it's a multi-paced market. So you know, things are moving at different paces um, um, in different geographies and different asset classes. So there's no you know one answer for for these sort of questions. But is it now that I have you here? You know. You probably work with uh, uh, with other folks on 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 your on your desk. You know, we're trading more liquid instruments. Like I said, do you think we've reached a point there where manual intervention um, inflow can't decline much more because you know there are not many people trading liquid, very very liquid asset classes in banks at least. So I think I would allude to your, uh, uh, you know, to your last uh, comment that you made. You know, when there were thirty euro dollar spot traders trading on this, I think there might be three now, but you you will probably see twenty seven of those are actually the the remaining twenty seven roles have moved into coding or the mm. algorithmic side of things. So I think the absolute number might have slightly reduced, but you know they are probably now known as e traders in a mm. lot of the banks who are more of a hybrid between. Uh, voice trading and algorithmic trading. So I think, in terms of manual intervention, I, I actually don't think we have reached a limit. If I still look at it, I think there's a lot more work that can be done, especially mm. when you. I think a, a person really pointed out on machine learning, uh, and if you if you look at things like big data analysis, alternative data analysis, I think there is still a long path ahead of us where actually. We would be able to automate things a little bit more further. Obviously, that this doesn't mean that the manual trader disappears. You know, the manual mm. trader will be is basically gets reincarnated into a different role. You know, I think mm. Athen spoke about it a little bit. You know, nowadays you don't really have full-fledged voice traders, but mm. people who are a mix. You know, who trade both electronic and voice. Mm. So I think that's the model that you would eventually end up into. But I still think. There is a way to go. Like I said, it seems to me a lot of attention and money has got into getting the prices to clients and trying to mm. figure out that price in very liquid markets. I, I think, mm. I think there is still a lot more scope and a lot more work that needs to be done for mm. in in this area. Mm. Sure, um, uh, Manoj, um, on the corporate side, you know, uh, is it possible for you to talk about how automation is affecting uh, trading rooms? Yeah, I would tend to agree with um, uh, Arijit. Arijit actually. So, in uh, the lot of work has already been done in liquid markets and uh, uh, you know uh, the non-restricted currencies, uh, so to say. So, uh, for example, in a lot of corporates and banks, uh, uh, these these freely traded currencies, less than a certain threshold, are a straight through process. No manual intervention at all is required. Let's say uh, in a trade less than ten million dollars or something like that. But what needs to be done, and what I'm waiting for, is the uh, you know uh, technological breakthrough in emerging markets uh, uh, actually. So as Arjit pointed out, in a in a country like Taiwan, Vietnam, Philippines, etc., etc., lots of manual intervention is required because there are certain um, you know, restrictions on underlying details before you can uh, before you can enter into a. Uh, FX transactions. So those areas, I think, are still to be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, taken care by technology. I think there are lots of invention happening there as well. Like, for example, uh, now the invoices and purchase orders can be read and converted to text, which you know reduces lots of uh, um, uh, headcount in op in operations uh, actually. Mm. So mm. I think those are the areas which will which needs to be you know tackled more from technology point of view. Sure. Thanks, and thanks, Anuj. That's a completely different perspective. Yeah. 
Um, um, you know, I have a lot of other questions, but for the want of time, you know, I'd probably have to skip uh, skip quite a few of them. But before I move on to this rapid fire round, I'd, I'd probably like to bring in Aten for, you know, one final time here. Aten, you, you've been in the industry for a very long time and we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, people with uh, getting into trading loads um, as lateral hires. Do you have any experience? Would you like to add something to that? Yes, I mean, I think uh, just want to add on to what uh, I think Saurabh mentioned or someone else mentioned. That uh, I, I mean, one thing I don't agree is is the age factor. Uh, clearly, I mean, there's yes for some sort of styles of trading, there's the age factor is important. But if you want to go into trading or if you want to just trade, doesn't matter what the age is. Uh, for example, hedge fund industry average age is much higher. Than a, sure. than, a buy, uh, than a bank side. Secondly, I would say try to get into uh, markets, whichever area, whether it's sales, whether it's sales of uh, corporate sales, whether it's hedge fund sales, whether it's institution sales, try to stick to the markets. As long as you are part of the markets, uh, I've seen a lot of times when people are getting shifted to the trading role. Unfortunately, what's happened in the last 10, 15 years the number of traders have come down because of cost cutting, because of uh, 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 sorry, uh, technologization. I mean, a lot of uh, electronic media coming. But I think you'll have a situation. You'll have uh, probably five years down the line. You'll have a situation where there's again demand for traders, not only in the buy side and sell side also. And it makes sense to stick to to markets role, whichever area you get in. So you think that the pendulum has swung? Uh, you know. Uh, to an extreme side right now and you know uh, in terms of number of traders yes, yes. I, mean, I, I don't see banks uh, big banks I mean I've seen uh, city Goldman Deutsche mm -hmm. having lesser staff in trading than what it is right now that's my favorite comment of the evening thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> okay um, uh, uh, Atin while we, we have you here you know let's start with our rapid fire round yes three or four words max Okay. Sure. My first question to you: Do you go for a bigger role in a smaller shop, or a smaller role in a bigger shop? Uh, then again, sorry, I generally won't. But start with a career with a bigger, uh, smaller role in a bigger shop. But uh, now I prefer bigger role in a smaller shop. Okay. And flow trading or prop? Prop. No okay, that was easy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can we uh, can we can we move to uh, Sarab now? Sarab, uh, how do you unwind? Uh, uh, it, it depends. If I'm stressed, spending time with kids is the best uh, thing. Uh, when you're happy, partying out, you know, a bottle of wine with friends is amazing. Uh, when I need to think. I go for a swim. It's very therapeutic. Um, and what's your most favorite month ever? Uh, September 2008 or March 2020? Well, 2008 was a teacher. You know, 2020, I was navigating a bigger ship, so, so I would say you know, 2020. Okay. So are you hinting that, you know, you took the lessons on board and, and, uh, and kept the ship steady? Okay, you don't need to answer that. Uh, <laughs> Arijit. Technical analysis or fundamentals? Uh, I think fundamental analysis tells you the destination. Technical analysis tells you the path to that destination. Oh, 10 out of 10. What a beautiful answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you have a macro idea, um, how, would you, how would you trade it? Through options or through Delta 1? Uh, so when I joined my desk, my, my boss told me this. is op When you're paying an option, you're basically paying someone to watch the screen for you. So if you have that kind of money to spare and you don't have, you know, and you don't have the high conviction, I think options is fine. Otherwise, I would go with Delta One. No, yeah, okay. options give you leverage. Leverage, I think. I think the options very difficult to have that leverage in Delta as you have an option. Correct. So I, big, I have not seen any trader making big money in Delta unless he or she has used options. I mean, you can use options in Delta One trading also, right? But Options is the way the big money is. Yep, agree with you. Okay, I let me a Manoj question for you. Um, uh, what is the one thing that you like the most about your role? 
the the sheer volume of it because that keeps me on my toes hello yeah hi can you uncle hello. can you hear me yeah, we can hear you we can hear everyone else can hear yeah. you manoj i can't manoj i can't hear you i think everybody no, else can hear you. so i said manoj, i said I the uh, sorry volume, can you hear me i said the, i said the sheer volume of it because that keeps me on my toes all the time in the last anchor okay uh someone else uh, sorry uh, can you can you yeah, can you am i am i am i audible yeah you're yes. back yeah okay i'm anuj uh, i had a question for you and i two actually yeah so yeah. who's your let's start with who's your favorite author john hall or frank fabozzi Fabuzi is excellent book for fixed uh, income. I, I can't hear you, Manoj. Uh, can everybody else hear me? Yes, everybody else can. Okay, but I can't hear Manoj. Uh, when everyone else can hear Manoj. Okay, strange. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, okay, I, I, I live Fred. I think. I, I live Fred. I think he said Fabuzi. Can you hear me now, Ankur? I think he can't. We, we can translate it for him. Don't worry. Go yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what's what's the thing that you like most about your own manage? So I said the uh, the the volume of the uh, of the flow, uh, Ankur. That because the, uh, that keeps me on the on my toes all the time. Okay. I see you stop back. <laughs> I can't hear you at all. So this is this is this is funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wish I could can move on to you. Can you say at least hello so that I know if I can hear you or not? Abhishek. So, uh, Ankur, I can't hear you, but I hope that you have. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me, Abhishek? Hello. Hi, yeah. Ankur. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Now I can hear you. Um. So, question for you: When in trouble, double or sit out? So it depends on the amount of money in my I have in my kitty. If I have decent no, amount of money, then double up. Three, otherwise, three, sit out. Three or four words. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh what is the most single most personality trade for a for a trader so for me it is uh, adaptability and discipline see you over thank you um um and let's hello ankur yeah i i have that thank you thank you abhishek then one last question to everyone you know we had this we had this thing about your favorite movie on trading and uh, let's start with you abhishek is there one that you particularly like so my favorite movie is big shot and the scene is in where the christian bail in the monitor used to write the losses number every day and in the end when actually he stayed gone in the direction as he wanted he started writing the profit number and okay. that is that what your dreams are made of i think we lost them okay manoj over to you uh my uh, favorite uh, movie is trading places ankur uh which is little uh, you know comical and uh, dramatic and not as serious as uh, the big shot or the wolf of, of uh, wall street um i like the last few you know uh, i like the last uh, 20 30 minutes the most because they actually show the trading floor in one pretty well okay i, I see your stock talk <laughs> so i'll take my cue from there <laughs> sort of over to you Uh, I'm going to be a spoiled sport. I'm uh, I don't think any trading movie really uh, depicts the real life uh, trading situations or or even the fun, the ecstasy anything. So I'm going to pass. Okay. Clever answer. Are you Uh I would actually say the doc um the the documentary Billion Dollar Day. I think it's on YouTube. I think that's the one I found it to be closest to a currency trading desk in the past, but I think that's that's what shows it uh, which is the closest one. Okay, and Athen, now you are not allowed to say what Saurav said, so you have to pick some. 
No, I have. Uh, I like Michael Burry, man. Tom, uh, big shot. Okay. 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 That movie shows okay. shows not only what is good about hedge funds, it also shows what is wrong about hedge funds and the financial system. So, so I love that movie. Based on a sample size of two fixed income traders like Big Short. <laughs> okay, um, I think that that is that is. Uh, let me try and see if there are any questions that I should be taking. But if not, then I think I can thank you all for your time today. Um, I I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I hope it was useful for the people watching. Um, if you're looking to uh, if you're looking to make a career in trading, um, uh, you know. Um, I hope it was it, it it was useful to you and uh, best of luck to to all the aspirants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.